forward to the class. All right, we're recording now. All right, then I made your co-host. Okay. All right, so you should be able to do whatever you need to do. So okay. let me introduce you real quick. Okay. Um, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm so glad that you're able to be here with us. I know this is an online course, but I've told you throughout the semester um, that we will be having some online sessions um, sequenced um, here at the same time. And today we've been um, fortunate to have um, Jenny White with us from the School of the Arts here in North Carolina. Um, she's a teacher there and a resident um, ex, um, expert in Desmos. And um, I encourage you all to go to the teacher conferences. You never know who you're going to meet. Um, Jeannie and I met on a whim, and then, now we just be, kind of become friends. And, you know, and I never knew that this is what I'd be doing. So, you know, sometimes when you meet people, you know, I tell people all the time in teacher education, it's not, you don't have to know everything. You just got to know how to find everything. And, um, and I know where my limitations um, are. And I was able to find Ms. White and asked her, and we talked about some things over the summer. One of the documents that you had in the beginning that was showing you some of the bases of Desmos, that was one that she created. And I asked her, would she be willing to help us out by being part of the class tonight? And she so graciously obliged. So uh, please give your undivided attention to her. This session, I am recording it with the intention that I will place it on YouTube later. So um, focus as much as you can on what she's doing. And also, like I said, take notes or whatever you need to take. But do note, you also will be able to get this back later. So I, I do want you to know that. So without further ado, Ms. White, um, the class is all yours. All right. Um, well, thanks for having me. Uh, just to plug a little bit the conference that's happening next week. So NCCTM is going to be in Greensboro Thursday and Friday. Um, we do have a Mitt Boss North Carolina booth. So it's a group of educators who are all on Twitter. And we use Twitter for the purposes of professional development. Can you explain them what Mitt Boss is? They may not know that. So it's the Math Twitter blog O Sphere of North Carolina. Um, it's a hashtag that's been around since about 2012. And it's just a bunch of teachers, math teachers in particular, who are using the internet to try to connect and lesson plan and help raise each other up because our profession is kind of hard. <laughs> and you need to have a support group so that you can do what you need to do. Uh, we enticed Dr. Ely with a cup of coffee last year. So come on out, we'll still have coffee this year. Um, and then I'm doing two sessions. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, tonight we're gonna talk about Desmos and I believe you want me to try to live create one. And I chose what I think can be middle school appropriate. So I'm using some of the grade six and seven standards for statistics um, to kind of use it as a foundation for re-talking about statistics in Common Core Math One was the goal for this. Um, Dr. Ely, how do I share my screen? So you see at the bottom of your little, a little share button, you see it says share? Uh, yes. And then you select your screen from the auto share. Okay, sweet. And then you hit share, we should, you're sharing, and there we go, we see your desktop, cool. All right, sweet. So I made a little bit of a slideshow. We'll see if I can get it out of the way so you can see everybody. All right, so let's make it. So whatever you see is what we see, so you just know okay. that. <laughs> True story. All right, so um, goals for tonight. <clears throat> We're in a storyboard and activity builder, then try to live build a prototype. And then a hashtag we use on Twitter a lot whenever we make an activity builder and we'd like people's feedback on it is we use this hashtag improve my AB. And if you tweet that out, most likely Jay Chow, who is employed full time by Desmos, will be the first person to respond. His job is to monitor that hashtag. Wow, among so you have somebody who can actually help you do your AB. Yeah, um, Jay is a master mind. We already, we already learned this stuff already. That I already know. That's yeah, cool. he's, um, he lives in Hawaii and he's a new father. So he works basically some very odd hours, but he's always around whenever I tweet and is usually there to help me within about five minutes. Um, so then once we finalize our activity, we'll see if there's anything we can improve on it. 
and then I can share the code and people can tweak it and use it however they want. Um, so the goal here is to take some pre-existing familiarity with dot plots, box plots, histograms, measure of center, um, everything from the middle school statistics strand and use that as a launching point to rejog students' memory in Common Core Math 1. Having had the pleasure of teaching that for three years, I can say they sadly forget a lot of middle school statistics. Um, so trying to get it all back in their brain so we can use it again. So Desmos has, um, I can share with you all, I think I actually maybe link to it in the PDF I sent to you earlier, but they have design principles that are how they structure their um, activity builders to try to maximize student engagement. And then I found this template kind of works for me. It's like a iteration on theirs. Um, so my kind of default template for making a Desmos is have some slides at the beginning that are intended to hook students' interest something that's got a really low floor um, that allows students who might be hesitant to participate. Um, it pulls them in and makes them interested in it. So some examples of things that you can Google if you're wondering what those look like are open middle problems. Um, we're actually going to focus on those today in this activity builder. Then something called would you rather, which is on the spectrum of debate math questions or you could look at like a which one doesn't belong. So some sort of hook or launch or engage their interest activity. Um, so once you've got them hooked into the activity, you then kind of let them play for a little bit. So I like to have some low stakes slides that allow students to make conjectures or make guesses on how they think the math is working. And it's got a built-in check so they know if they're right and they know if they're wrong. So once they've got an interested and they've played for a little bit, then a few slides to kind of formalize whatever math you want to have in your slide or in your activity builder. Um, and that's usually a good opportunity to use my favorite button, which is the pause button on an activity. Um, usually once you've hooked their interest and they're playing, when you push that pause button, the entire class groans. You just hear this audible, oh, because they wanted to keep on working on what they're working on. And that's a good opportunity to take a few minutes to formalize some math. I usually have notes that might correspond in there where we'd write down some definitions or write down some things that we need to remember. And then we'd start back up with some practice, um, allow them to reinforce whatever thing they just learned. And then I've done a lot of research over the summer on the necessary moment of conclusion or reflection and how important it is to provide students the opportunity to verbally somehow reiterate what they learned. Um, so I've started adding in every year or every activity builder this year some sort of concluding slide. Um, my favorite thing to do right now is this bottom one, which is give the students some sample students work with a commonly made error or misconception and then ask the students what kind of advice would they give the student to fix any misconceptions they may have. Um, I like to then pull those back up and use them later on in the um, either the lesson or the week or the unit, but it's proven to be the one that I think gets the most out of everything. So any questions so far? Okay. All right, so um, I sat down a couple days ago and storyboarded the task. So I think my biggest takeaway from being a Desmos fellow this summer, they flew 40 of us out to Desmos headquarters in um, San Francisco. And we were there for a long weekend and we had the opportunity to network um, and learn more about how Desmos works behind the scenes. And the biggest takeaway they had for me at least was what I thought was a waste of time based on how I assumed everyone else made their Desmos activities. Um, I fell into that trap that our students do where they think people who work fast and people who don't show their work are the better mathematicians. I had that mentality about people who make Desmos activity builders. I thought that it was the people who could just sit down in front of a computer and magically make things happen were the ones who were the best at making them. 
Um, but it was really nice to have the opportunity to hear Dan Meyer and Eli and all of the other Desmos people say, no, we sit down at a whiteboard and we sketch out what we want it to look like and move things around and have the opportunity to discuss. So it reiterated how important drawing a rough draft for what you want it, the activity builder to look like and why that's helpful. So here's my rough draft. Um, slide one, we're gonna open with an open middle problem that I believe is from the grade seven standards um, on mean, median, and range. So it's asking students to fill in a data set so that they can have the same mean, median, and range, then have the opportunity for a reflection question. Um, slide two is gonna be another open middle problem. It's a box plot problem where they use the digits one through nine, one time only, to try to make a data set that has the smallest IQR and the largest range possible. Um, the original problem talks about the skew, but I think I'm gonna avoid that today. Um, then there's a second part to that open middle problem where now it says make the IQR be greater than five and the range greater than seven. Um, have a little reflection, built in time to pause to have the teacher have the opportunity to recap some vocab or talk about how you make a box plot. Um, we'll start to wrap things up with a third open middle problem, then move towards some formative assessment type problems. Um, I'm going to show you all what the multiple choice feature looks like. Um, we'll then also have the opportunity for talking about how we can embed different components into our activity builder. And then lastly, I think we'll add, um, I'll show you how to copy from other people's activity builders. So in case you see something on the internet that you like slides two through eight of, I'll show you how you can just take those slides and put them in your own activity with now, Paul, tweaking. Now, if I stop you real quick right there, Jim. If you decide to do that and you're using somebody else's activity, make sure you give them credit. Yes. Got it? I will bang you on that. And yeah. Desmos, the culture. It's, I don't mind because I get it. I mean, you know, some things, you know, you can create. It's kind of like doing hip hop music, right? You make other music from other music, right? Which is fine. It's still the other music. But even in hip hop, they give credit. Hey, this was Gladys Knight. And this right here was dolomite or whatever and you put it all together and you got it something you call it your own you know what i mean which is fine if you're gonna remix it but you need to make sure you get credit got it we clear i'm sorry miss white i want to make sure that was the no you're fine um it gives me an opportunity to talk about the language people use most often when they borrow slides from other people is they'll say edited with love by so if you search for any of the activities i've done it usually has the link to the original activity builder and then it says edited with love by Jenny White. Um, so just a nod to here's where I got this stuff from, but I tweaked. I something. like that. So yeah. you heard what she said. Make sure if you get it and you edited something that you modify, please put the link in there so we'll know that. Um, Tough, you you own. Go ahead and ask questions. Yeah, I have a question. So you know what, like you're saying, use we can use open middle. Mm -hmm. uh, how does Okay, if I know you're saying give credit to whoever. I know normally when I have edited a Desmos activity, it automatically says, okay, this person was the original. Yeah, it, they originally did it. And then, it, like you said, it says edited by. But my question is, are there any issues? Because I did come in late with um, copyright laws, even if we go back and give somebody credit. For example, like our main resource is Open Up Resource. It is free online. Mm -hmm. So we're given the um, autonomy to run it off for our students and everything like that. So I just wanted to know how does this all fit into that with Desmos? Yeah, so let me double check somewhere. On this website somewhere, there is a Creative Commons copyright um, legalese that says what level you are allowed to disseminate and share open middle problems. And it tends to be pretty standard across most of the people who are putting content out there. Um, a lot of them started on Twitter. So Robert Koplansky, the open middle guy, um, I'm the open up resources, all of those people are currently and actively tweeting um, in the MitBoss hashtag. 
And we all tend to use a level of Creative Commons that says you can borrow as long as it is not for profit, not for sale, not for marketing or relicensing. So essentially, if you're using it in your classroom and you're using it for good, okay. If you're using it to make money or you're using it to, I guess, pretend that it's your own, that would be bad. I understand. Okay. So what I usually do is I'll show you for when we start making one of these. So let me change this window just a little bit so we can see what's going on. Um, so some things about when you log into Teacher Desmos, um, up here in the top corner, if you click on labs, we're going to play with, Ross, let's stop. I'm sorry, my dog's licking me. Um, we're going to play with some of these later if we come back together at another time, but having Marble Slide turned on, the ability to use geometry, and then computational layer is um, Desmos computer coding that if you'd like to learn more about, it's pretty powerful and it's a lot of fun to learn. Um, but having those labs on just kind of helps things work a little bit better for you and it allows you to copy slides from other presentations because if these aren't turned on and somebody else's activity builder uses them, you wanna be able to copy it. But when you log in and you create a new activity, where most people, so let me see. call it box block. Once you've done through all of your creating and you get over here to this next feature, in this description is usually where people will cite or source anything. So if I was going to put the activity we make today out on the internet, I would say we're using Math 6, open up resources, problem blank with the URL and all of that citing, and that would cover my needs for what we're doing. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. Sweet. All right, so um, I understand that you all have built a few um, activity builders. Is that true? Yes. So they're there in the very beginning. Um, some of them may have because they had their own prior experience, but in this course, uh, we was at the very beginning of that, so um, you can start as elementary as you would like. Unless, okay. you know, they ask for some more advanced things, but, you know, um, y'all know Miss White is a resource to you also. This is your chance to ask. You, I mean, every day you get somebody who went and worked with the people who designed this stuff. So. Yeah, come to the conference. You'll meet a lot of us. Um, Especially you, Katrina. You asked all the questions, and now you get, I got, I got you there. Uh, even try. I do have a question though. I saw this really neat activity. It was, and I think you all went back and approved it. Desmos went back and approved it. But um, one of the activities I had pulled for the teachers for a PD was, uh, and it was for new teachers, and I was just showing different activities that they could use with Desmos as well as the calculator. But a neat activity I had found was a breakout. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. I, I made that. Okay, I love that one. And my question was, how do you lock? I guess one slide to make them go. Um, so that's that two AG right now. So I need to start with the basic. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's just the computational layer, the okay. computer coding that I was talking about earlier. Okay. That's for all of that. So for me, it um, I would say I'm a slightly high beginner, low intermediate level. Okay, okay, got it. Um, so for me, it's a lot of looking at other people's slides and taking code and then adjusting okay. it to my needs. Okay. But that is pretty advanced making that happen. Okay. In terms of what you need for CL. But you can do some similar things. And I think the part of that that probably drew you into it was that it was self-assessing, right? That students right. knew if they were right or wrong. Right. And that's one of the most powerful things that I learned about at Fellows Weekend is, well, there's ways to do that without CL. And so we're going to look at that a little bit right now. Um, so like my first thought for this activity was to do open middle. I just printed out. Um, and what it says is create a set of five positive integers that range from one to 20 that have the same mean, median, and range. And so the way you can make that self-checking is just by making it have a graph component that does a lot of the calculations for you. So if I was going to have this for students, I'd put a quote 
and I had to give them the direction. So create a set of points. Five. Ooh, five positive integers from one to 20 that have the same mean, median, and range. Um, my favorite new hack for Desmos oops, is that if you type in the word folder, it pops up a folder for you. And you can hide things from students. Um, I found that whenever I am creating a graph that has a lot of stuff happening in it, it's really best if I keep all of the guts away from the students because they might accidentally delete something and that might make it so the activity doesn't work. Um, but some things to know about the way this line two works. We're going to look at a lot of the statistics components of Desmos, which just got announced on Monday, are going to be live on the embedded North Carolina common assessments. Um, so last year we did not have access to these tools. This year we do. So North Carolina must have approved the budget to pay more money. Um, so this capital letter equals square bracket allows me to put in a set of values. And it treats this as a discrete set of integers, or they could be non-integers. Um, the five element list. I can now ask Desmos to do calculations on these things. So I can have a variable that I'll call A. And I could say, all right, well, we're going to figure out what the mean of list L is. And it will tell me the mean of those numbers that I made is 6.4. I can have another one that I'll call the median. And then I don't think, let's check. Nope. Um, see how it's still italicized when I type range? That means that that's not a functionality in Desmos. But if I can't figure out what the range is, I can get it to do the min. Let's see that equals C. And I can have it do the max. And then I can set another variable that's just the max minus the min. And so now I've got the math for the prompt. So when the students type in numbers here, these values are going to change, right? So I can then create points on the graph, it's like zero comma two, and I can have it so that the label says your mean is, and then if you have any familiarity with any basic level coding, if you put a dollar symbol, squiggly brackets and then call the variable you want, it will call back up that variable. So 6.4 is the mean. And the thing that's really cool here is if you change the numbers, the mean changes with it. So it's interactive. Um, and so we can do that for some other things. So now we can say, I'll do 0, 04. The median is whatever was that be, and 0, 06. Um, and so we can have all of these things here. Some nice things to know about the labels is that you can change the font size, you can make it bigger, and you can change the orientation to where it is on the point. Um, I have a few students who have some sight impairments this year. And so I've gotten in the habit of making sure that everything is always set to this largest font size, just because it helps them see it. Um, so it's an accessibility thing that's really nice. So the way I like to test this once I think I've done everything I want is if you hit the preview button, you'll see what the students see when they log in. So, um, okay. So what it says here is I can play around now. So I can say, and now you can see how everything goes and it would allow students to play with it until they get their range, their median and their mean to all be the same. So that would be the goal of the first slide is just to have them play with that until they're able to get what they want. Um, the lines that are here are because I didn't unhighlight these things. So once you create a variable, just hide it so that it's not in the way. 
Um, so now if I were to play with this thing over here, those lines wouldn't appear anymore. It wouldn't be a distractor for students. Um, so that was the first slide. Um, all we did here was use the graph component and some insider knowledge for how we can play with things. Um, and we just set those values to points so that as students play, it'll tell them automatically what their numbers are. Um, we can then add on the next screen a note that says like, what was your methodology for creating a data set to have the same mean, median, and range. And they can enter their text down here and we can have it set so they can show each other their responses. I like to have a reflection slide after some play slide like that, just so that I can see what they were thinking, because otherwise I don't know. Um, for the next one, the other open middle that I was going to do, I wanted to show you the functionality of, you can drag and drop from open middle. The thing I really like about open middle is that they've got, let me try to find, where I put that screenshot. Ah, there it is. They have some pretty nice graphics for how things look. And you can drag the graphic to your screen. So it's on your graph. And you could have the students literally drag the numbers. So the way an open middle works is that it'd say something like use the numbers zero through nine to create a set of data, what does this one say? With the smallest possible IQR. And the largest range. So they're only allowed to use the numbers zero through nine, so we could make points that move with the students. So if I type in a coordinate point A, B, and I allow sliders, it's going to make it so this point I can move all over the grid wherever I want it to go. And then I can associate a label with it so I can call that point zero. So now a student could move that point right there. And that would be how they're going to display their answer. And so you can just make lots of sliders for all of the numbers and they could drag them to where they, oops, sorry. They could drag them to where they wanted to go. And then on the teacher slide, you could pull up a student's response and you could compare several of them. So I've done this before with a lot of success. The students really like that they can see what numbers they've used and what numbers they haven't used. Um, some accessibility issue things that you can work about. Um, projector mode is a really nice way just to make everything look bold. And you can turn off the grid if you feel like that would be a distractor for your students. So you can just have all of your numbers kind of lined up over here on the side, ready to go, and they can drag them over to where they want. Does that make sense? Or do you want me to show you how to do more of those points? Sorry, my dog is making noise. <laughs> I thought that was one of my students all about to meet somebody. <laughs> no, it's, um, here, let me show you. This is our big dog. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he keeps us safe. Um, he makes a lot of noise this time of night, so apologies. But yeah, so the idea for this slide, um, if we had more time, I'd finish it. I don't really want to waste time doing the same points, is that I just make more variables here and I'd add the numbers zero through nine so we could just drag them over. Um, the idea for the next slide was to have almost the exact same setup. And if you want to repeat something, so like let's say I've done all this work, I've made all these points and I'd like to use them again. If you click this little button right here, you can duplicate the slide and it carries everything over. So then you don't have to worry about redoing anything. Um, and that saves me a lot of time whenever I'm making these because usually you've done a lot of coding to make something happen and you don't want to have to waste it. Um, Another thing that you can do for an activity builder is if you have saved a graph in your just regular Desmos account. So here's a set of data. So I've got a data set L, K, and M where I've made a dot plot for each one that you can turn on and off so you can see it. 
And then I've made box plots for each one. So you can turn off and on and see. Um, I wanted to use this data set to make a multiple choice question, but I didn't want to have to re-enter this data set every single time. So what you can do is you can make it in your Desmos account, come up here and click the URL. And then if you go back to your activity builder, you can paste your URL in the first slide or the first row, and it's imported all of my data. So now I can craft the slide that I wanted, which says like match the dot plot to the box plot. So I can turn on the dot plot I want, which is which one? 21. Yeah, we'll turn on this one. So I can turn that on and then I can click this choice button and now I can turn this into a multiple choice situation. I think I wanted it to be M. Oops. Yeah, that plot for M. Um, so now I can go to the graph button right here because this is multiple choice and I can click graph and I can do the same exact thing where I paste in the previous um, screen's graph. There's a glitch happening in Desmos right now that I've reported that as soon as I hit paste in the multiple choice section, there's this like big white blank section. You click done and then come right back to it. That goes away. I don't know why, but Desmos is working on it. Um, so now I can go through and I can put one box plot on each one of my slides um, or each one of these multiple choice questions. So I just did L. I can now put my box plot for K. And then I can come put my box plot for M. And what this looks like for the students, it says match the given dot plot over here to the box plot. And I hope that you all agree with me that right now these are kind of hard to see. Um, so something that you can do is you can go back in Turn on projector mode. I like to turn off the grids and just kind of zoom in, make this like negative one. I guess I need bigger numbers for what I'm doing here. 15, I'm gonna make this negative two, three. There we go. And now when we look at the preview, okay, well I zoomed out a little bit too far. Let's fix that. There we go. Um, now when you look at the preview, that looks a little better and we can play with the window just to make it look nice. So you can come in here to your X axis and you can add in steps. So if I make the step one, there's now going to be a point at every level. Um, another thing about the box plots is right now I've got an offset to be three units up and I can change it so it's one unit up. Um, you can also change the height of a box plot if you need it to be taller. Um, just thinking about accessibility, if any of you have students who need that, um, and also just makes it easier to read. So we've looked at how to do some graph behind the scenes work, how to incorporate a graph with some multiple choice. Um, there's a couple other components that I really like to use that I wanted to just talk about outside of this activity that we're crafting. Um, the sketch feature students really, really enjoy because you as the teacher can have them all projected on the board. And so depending on what you're trying to do, you can have them either, you can make the background be a graph, you could turn it into a number line by getting rid of everything but just the x-axis. And you could leave that here and you could have something where you ask the students to draw a box plot for a given set of data. So then they'd all draw something that looks like, you know, like this. And then you, the teacher, could project all of these together on the board. And it's really, really powerful because when all the students are thinking the same thing, all of their graphs kind of line up almost perfectly. And so it allows you that opportunity where they can all be like, yes, we're all doing it right. Or if there's one kid whose graph is like way over here, they then know that they didn't do something right and they should go fix that. Um, so I really like using the sketch feature. Um, something else you can use, uh, you can insert media. So you can drag and drop a video or an image in here 
um, if you wanted to do like show a video of something and then you ask them like it's got a timestamp at the bottom, at what time do you think they'll cross the finish line? Um, this would allow you to show a video. Videos work with uh, input components. So you can have the video running over here and then have students answer a question over here. Um, and I think the last thing I had on my agenda to make sure I showed you all is how to borrow from other people's activities. Uh, where is that one? So um, David Petro, if you haven't heard of him, is a wonderful mathematician who shares things so willingly on his website. Um, so if you go to engaging-math.blogspot.canada, um, you'll see he's got everything. It's aligned to the Canadian Common Core Standards, but they're pretty much the same as the Americas, and you can figure out what goes with what. Um, so he has a histogram activity that I really like. It's got a card sort, which is how you can move things together like this. Um, got another card sort for histograms and bar graphs, and then he's got some pretty good leading questions for how to think about histograms. So if I wanted to borrow slides, what I would do is come over here, click copy and edit. It would open the activity builder on my slide. And then I can come over here and hit control V. Um, I'm on a Mac, so technically it's command V for me, but whatever. Um, and then I can come over here and, oops, sorry, I said control V, I meant control C. I need coffee. Stuff, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then if you click control V, it um, paste it there. So I can borrow whatever I want from his activity by hitting control C on the slide, bringing it back over to mine and hitting control V. And it brings everything over. And the only thing to be wary of is that if you see this little cog right here, if you copy something over and that's on, it's because there's something in this computational layer and if it if you didn't change the variables or if the variables that they have don't match what you have you'll get up this little orange triangle that says like Houston there's a problem here um, you can usually fix that by well there's some steps you'd have to do but I could show you how to fix that if that ever happens to you um, but yeah I think that's what I wanted to get through. Do you all have any questions for components we've looked at or things you'd like to try? We can do some stuff on the fly if you've got anything you want me to create real fast. Questions, this is your opportunity. Nobody has any questions? Um, I, I'll go ahead and ask a question. Go ahead. Okay, so my question is, um, the other, can you show some, I know the most that I've really seen, okay, you know how you had the marbles, you had to turn on each one of those. Mm -hmm. you go in and create an actual activity. Aren't there certain ones that you can, only certain ones that you can really do, or is that just something that I just assume? I mean, so I can make a marble slide right now. Um, so what you do is you label where the slides, where you want the stars to be. Uh -huh. It's nine o'clock. All right, and then you can say where you want the ball to start off. So we'll do zero, eight. Yeah, let me throw some parentheses around here. Change the screen. And then this could be the slide. So then the students would have like, Mm -hmm. Where's my square button? There we go. Oh, let's make that plus where I wanted it to be. Sorry, new keyboard. I can't do this without looking now. Um, so they could play with whatever they needed to to get it to work. And then click launched. And I know it won't get everything, but just playing with it off the fly. Mm -hmm. um, so I tend to make marble slides for transformations of functions, um, trying to get vertex form is really nice for quadratics. Um, you can do lots of linear marble slides for kind of the middle school math, so doing lots of the horizontal vertical, talking about domain restrictions, because um, it gets pretty cool when you then talk about saying, okay, well, I want x to be less than or equal to four. Um, 
So doing those domain restrictions can be a lot of fun for students. Um, Sean Sweeney has put out what he calls the Desmos Marble Slide Challenge. Um, so if you Google, And who uh, was the um, other guy that you had named from engaging, wait, the Canada guy? Um, David Petro. David Petro? Mm-hmm, P-E-T-R-O. Okay. Um, but yeah, so if you Google Marble Slide Challenge and Sean Sweeney, he's created a challenge and he opens up one every week for his students um, and they play them. So it could be just a fun math wall activity too. So it doesn't necessarily have to be um, in content. Okay. Any other thing you've seen that you'd like to learn about? Um, I pretty much know how to do the card sort. That's okay. probably one of the easier ones to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of some. Real quick, who was the guy that did the challenge again? Um, Sean Sweeney. Sean Sweeney. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No worries. Also, by tomorrow this time, I should have the link posted, and um, I'll send that into our Canvas website. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I could talk about some best practices for running a Desmos with your students, mm -hmm. um, because there's two fields of thought for how to deal with this. Let me go to some stuff I've done recently. Um, I made a special angles review that my students worked on. Oops, this is a blank one. There's one that has the kids in it. Here we go. So when you're in your teacher dashboard, you're gonna see something that looks like this. Um, you've got some options for making things happen here. So I tend to leave mine on summary mode. And as the students advance, I can see like where I'm putting my cursor is what it would look like for me, a little blue cursor over their box. I've turned on anonymize mode. And what it does is it takes all of my students' names and it turns them into mathematicians. Um, there's a list that Desmos curates of famous mathematicians. Um, whenever a student gets to a point where they have finished something early, I always tell them to go Google their mathematician, which is really fun. Um, some things you can do for teacher move, you can turn on pacing. Mm -hmm. It's like if I just wanted my students to work through these first five slides, which is exactly what I had them do for this activity, it would restrict them so they could move freely in here, but they couldn't go past it. Um, you can then add slides when you're ready, or you can stop teacher pacing. Um, so the way this activity looks, whenever I click on a slide, I can see all of my students' individual work or I could overlay it so it's all on top of each other, which is kind of cool because you can see where all of their different points are. Um, and then if I saw something I liked, I could take this snapshot and I could select some of the students' work and, to broadcast. I'd have to do it in the screen like this, um, where I could be like, yes, I like this one, I like this one, I like this one. And then I can come over here to my snapshot window and I could drag them all over. And then when I pause, we could have a conversation about this. We're like, okay, so what do we think of this definition for same side angles? Um, is there anything we'd like to add? Is there anything we'd like to change? Um, so we had this conversation for curating the names for the special pairs of angles on parallel lines cut by a transversal. Um, so that's called the snapshots feature. There's a really good blog on the Desmos website that talks about how to use it um, and some just suggestions for ways that you can make it more powerful. Um, my favorite button right here is the pause button. Because <laughs> um, it really, it, it gets to some of the kids. Um, but yeah, I really like the dashboard. I think it's fun to be able to see. There's some programming you can do if you wanted to, so you can see if they get things right or wrong. Um, it kind of depends on what your motivation is. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest suggestions I have is make sure you always anonymize your students just so that you don't inadvertently put somebody on blast by having like a giant X right here and everybody knows it's so-and-so. 
um, the kids really like that autonomy too, that they don't, they can make a decision that might be the wrong one. And then we can have a conversation about it and they can like low key go back to the next slide and change their answer. Be like, I know better now. And they'll type in a better response. Um, so I like that it models changing your mind and changing your opinion for my students. Mm -hmm. I know with my students, when I had used the uh, anonymize, I stopped turning it on because they would go back and tell who they were. <laughs> so yeah. they enjoyed it. Um, I, I do like using the activities. I know um, the students weren't aware of the, the function functionality that I had. Mm -hmm. I was um, at home. I was sick at home. I had surgery and mm -hmm. I had given them an investigation activity. So I noticed that certain students weren't moving. Yeah. Their slides sat in the same spot. I called the school. I said, I need you to buzz me up to my room. And I said, I told the sub, I said, please put me on the uh, the speakerphone. I said, I need to know why such and such, such and such, such and such is not working. They were like, oh my gosh, you can see this? Yes. So they start seeing them progress through the um the activities. I'm excited this uh, this semester right here to really see what I can go back and create myself. I have created small activities, but I don't want to use those. I want to give something more towards open up what the teachers are already using. Yeah. Um, so um, if you're on Twitter, let me pull up just a regular Twitter and not my feedback. Um, open up resources actually has one of the strongest Twitter groups I think I've seen out there. Um, so if you look, open up, I think it's open up math. Yes, um, open up math and it's just I am teachers, mostly the middle school teachers because the middle school curriculum has been out longer than the high school curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all tweeting and talking. They have every Monday, it's a chat starting at 8.30. Um, locally in North Carolina, we've got Sarah Vaughn Oops, wrong thing. Come on, I hate the way this works now. Sarah Von Trapped. <laughs> um, if you have the opportunity to meet her, she's going to be at NCCTM this year. Um, she is one of their official coaches for the middle school curriculum, and she's based out of Greensboro, um, actually near Summerfield, Dr. Ely. <laughs> so she's out in that neck of the oh, woods. Is she at the middle school at Summerfield? Um, I believe she's at Northern. Oh, okay. I might be wrong, um, but this open up resources, the Twitter followers, the people who are actively engaging in this conversation, they're really good about sharing things. So um, if you just log into Twitter, create an account and look for this open up math, you're going to see people put lessons, people put activity builders, people are going to the thing I really like about Twitter and what open up stands for is that it's all about open source that here we made this content. How are you making it better? Um, so that's really nice. Then there's going to be a lot of people who already have um, Desmos activities made and they're going to post them too. So that could be nice for you to model. I know I um, used some of the geometry open up this year for my first unit in the geometry course I teach. Um, it came out too late. We start on the college schedule, so I had already started school by the time it was released this year. But the launch activities do really well for that hook portion of that um, model I was telling you about. And then some of their student guided things, I think, really do work very well with the Desmos frame. Um, like with any tool, don't overdo it. So don't do Desmos every day. Um, Sometimes things are done better on Desmos and sometimes things frankly are done better with patty paper and a pencil. Um, so just pay attention to what you're trying to do and see if Desmos enhances it. If it does, then use Desmos. If Desmos just makes it pretty, then eh, maybe not. All right, cool. If you ever need me, I'm here. Uh, now, Jennifer, you know, you know you don't say that because I will call you, Jenny. <laughs> I know. Well, but this is how we work on the internet and Twitter. So if you need me, I'm at Jen S. White. Um, I post probably too much. But I am very adamant about getting North Carolina teachers on Twitter, especially teachers who are in rural or siloed districts where they don't have the opportunity for a lot of professional development that this is free PD 24 hours a day where 
teachers generally want to help each other and lift each other up. Um, this is my passion. This is what I want to help promote. So I make the promise every year at NCCTM, if you tweet at me with what you want, I may not know the answer, but I know somebody who does. Back to the networking that Dr. Ely was talking about earlier. So as y'all can see, like I said, I met Jen at NCCTM. Remember, I've been encouraging you all to go. Some of y'all have gone. And you see the connections out there. I mean, the world is bigger than FSU. I mean, we like Fayetteville, but I need you connecting with good people like Jen, who's just so willing to help. A lot of the problems that you have is not a thing that you don't know. It's more of a thing you didn't ask. And if you don't ask, you have people like Jennifer. I mean, I'm going to call her Jen. Jenny out there who, um, you know what I'm saying, be more than help. I mean, she gave her own time tonight. She got to teach class tomorrow. She didn't have to do this, but she did because we asked her to. And it's many more others like her out there. We just got to ask. So please don't be ashamed. Don't think, you know, because you don't know something that you're supposed to know. Hey, it's always something, somebody that we, we feel like we're supposed to know, but that we might not know. Um, but I want you to use, you know, people like her, they're out here, resources to get out here and use social media for some of the good that is definitely there. We know there's plenty of bad, but there's also a lot of good out there that's happening. And this is one of the things, if you don't know something or you're missing pieces, um, we're grateful um, that you can find. So um, with that said, anybody else, any other questions for Ms. Um, White? I ask that we give her a virtual round of applause. Oh, thank you. And um, we're just grateful for you sharing this space with us today. Yeah. Uh, and um, if there's anything I need to do on your end to, you know, give you kudos or credit with your people, let me know. Yeah, we'll no, definitely no. do that. But we're just grateful um, to do that, um, that you have, that you get shared your information and they can reach out to you on an individual basis if they have other questions. Because yes. we do have people in various levels. We have some who are just trying to get certified. We have some who are certified. And then we have people like Miss um, Tuff here who's been in the field almost 20 years and she's a district coach. So we have people on various levels that have various levels of influence and can infiltrate in other ways. And I ask if you, you all can use her, please reach out, call her, bring her in, take care of her. And, um, and that's what we do in math. Yeah. All right. So uh, with that, um, Ms., um, I would take back over my class and give them a couple of housekeeping items and get out of here. All right. Well, have a great right, thank night. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you for having me. All right. All right. Thank you. Have a good night.